Hi, I'm Sarah Cowgill, along with Andrew Moran, Dave Patterson, John Clark, and Graham Noble. And this is the Conservative Five, Liberty Nation's online TV news program. On today's episode, Don't Shake a Dirty Hand, the Conservative Five discusses an unnerving new development with the feds in the war on speech. We'll also dig into the smoke and mirrors of the Biden regime in statistics and damn lies. Then we pivot to amber waves of grain in the politics of wheat. Polish it all off with a just for fun volume 48. All this and more coming up in this edition of the conservative. Maybe I'll be scarce there. Have you said something salty on Facebook recently? Maybe say something unflattering about a government official or stand up for the Second Amendment. Perhaps that will explain the unmarked black suburbans in the driveway and the dark suits approaching your front door. Wouldn't time be better spent ferreting out drug smuggling or Hillary's lost emails? According to two FBI agents recorded by one unhappy resident, they spend every day all day long interrogating Americans about their social media posts. The man who wrote the disturbing piece for Liberty Nation on Big Brother, Comes a Colin, is here to start the conversation off right. Graham Noble, that floor is yours, bud. Uh, Yeah, Sarah, that was an interesting story. Um, uh, The the lady in question you're talking about uh, lives in um, Oklahoma, I believe, and her name is Rolla Abdel-Jawad. Uh, now, Ms. Abdel Jawad is not a big fan of Israel, to put it mildly. Um, very strongly uh, pro Palestinian. Um, I don't want to say pro Hamas because that would be presumptive, but certainly pro Palestinian and strongly objects to what Israel is doing and I guess just objects to, you know, their very existence in general. So she posted some very strong comments on uh, Facebook. Uh, very. Um, uh, saying very unpleasant things about the Israelis. Uh, but at the end of the day, she didn't, her comments were, they, they did not include any direct threats. Um, they did not include any uh, any hint that uh, the lady in question was herself planning any kind of like terrorist attacks or, or planning to harm anybody. Uh, and yet the FBI rolled up at her door to ask her about these posts because apparently Facebook sent them screenshots of these posts uh, well, I, I don't get it i mean she's just ranting right she's just having a rant everybody has a rant on facebook it seems so why was hers different well I, you know that's it's hard to say because you know the fbi agents that turned up at her door actually told her that you know they were not there to arrest her <laughs> um, they just wanted to, they just do this. And they did say, you know, we do this, uh, all day, every day. Um, and, and it's to ensure that everyone's safe and that nobody is harboring any ill will, which as I, you know, thought to myself and I wrote on the pages of Liberty Nation that, okay, so is it now a potentially a criminal offense to harbor ill will? Because if it is, uh, most people who live in this country for one reason or another are probably in trouble. Uh, so it's all a bit silly. And no matter how offensive many Americans might have found Abdel Jawad's, uh, you know, posts and her opinions, that's that's beside the point. You know, we have free speech in this country. And that means that you are allowed or it should mean that you are allowed to say things even that a lot of other people or even things that everybody else thinks is highly offensive or highly objectionable in some way. The whole point of the story or or the meaning behind it is that uh, our First Amendment rights, not only our First Amendment rights, goes beyond the First Amendment, just the the normal kind of human right of being able to speak freely is being infringed in the name of, well, we're just trying to keep everybody safe. And uh, I personally just don't think that's a good enough excuse to uh, stop people expressing whatever opinions they have. No, and and honestly, it seems really, uh, and what surprised me about that particular part of your story was that's a progressive and we don't really usually censor progressives. Um, Hey, John Clark, um, that new law against hate speech, 
Church in uh, Scotland just came into force. Um, is that something that we might be headed to with this kind of activity? Well, I think we're already there and more. Scotland, Ireland also has pushed some similar initiatives. If you say something that is likely to make people feel upset, basically, I'm stretching a little bit, but it absolutely deviates from the American tradition. Now, we have some of the most uh, forceful free speech protections of any nation in the world. I've lived in the UK and things that there are banned are here called uh, free speech in the name of, of pornography. Uh, Canada, also apparently Mr. Trudeau has been uh, cutting back on this, but what we're talking about is attacking subjective speech and intention, attacking or banning the Confederate flag, for instance, that's free speech. We have case law allowing Nazis to protest and KKK people to protest. These are being cast aside by the Democrat party who, the these were liberal court decisions. We know that the Biden administration was using you know, safety or protection in COVID to regulate our speech in the name of misinformation, which actually was stifling true information. So I'm a bit of a free speech zealot. So in response to that video that I had seen before Graham wrote about it, so I watched your, saw your piece with interest, I've been becoming a little more outspoken. You are just getting a little goofy here. You told me. But to you be, did to mention okay. Canada. So that's a good pivot for me to go right to Andrew and ask him about the uncommon, crazy, uncommon sense tactics that Canada uses these days. Yeah, so John's absolutely correct. This this initiative is happening all over the all over the Western world. You have Ireland doing it, Scotland now, the UK. All, all these Western governments are imposing these laws. So Canada and Trudeau land, we have something called Bill C-63. It's known as the Online Harms Act. So it would impose sentences of up to five years for hate speech and lifetime imprisonment for advocating genocide. If I, if I may go back to uh, Bill C-63, if you said anything hateful on X or Facebook, you could receive a visit from the government, plus your accuser gets to be anonymous, and if you find out who the accuser is, you cannot speak out or risk going to jail again. But don't worry. The Trudeau government said that it will only go after extreme online hate speech. So, of course, you know where this is going. It's going to be a slippery slope. It's going to go from extreme hate speech to anything you say. And also, uh, the Trudeau uh, government assured everyone that everything is okay because they have a new definition of the word hate. It will be, quote, it now, it now means, quote, the emotion that involves detestation or vilification that is stronger than disdain or dislike. So Canadians can be assured. Uh, nobody's okay. going to get that. I, you know, uh, uh, I don't know what's going on, but well, I, the, this is nothing new in America. Dave, When uh, this censorship thing has been going on off and on here and there all through the course of our country. Am I right or am I wrong? You're right. As much as we'd like to think otherwise, you know, censorship has been part of the American landscape, you know, since Ben Franklin's brother, James, was thrown into jail in uh, 1722 when he published in the American Current a criticism of, you know, anonymous government official. And we've had it throughout our history. You know, the Sedition Act of 1918, which progressives love to throw around. Uh, you know, it limited the rights of free speech during World War I and making it a crime to, as it points out, willfully utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of government of the United States. Incidentally, uh, President Woodrow Wilson, the progressive's favorite son, supported it wholeheartedly. But we've had famous authors like James Joyce and, you know, Ernest mm. Hemingway had their books banned. I think what we're talking about today and what makes today's censorship a little bit different is uh, and that the Biden administration has actively uh, publicly colluded with the likes of Facebook and former Twitter and YouTube to ban points of view they find offensive and most Often it's, you know, a conservative points of view. They skirt the law and uh, without due process to eliminate from the public discourse, which we value highly, because if you're not talking about stuff, things can't be improved. Right. But uh, I think, too, it's in times past, we were unlikely to have, as you pointed, the, pointed out, the 
the black suburban with the uh, darkened windows pull up uh, with FBI agents who are actively abetting and aiding the censorship. The White House, even if you read uh, Liberty Nation's coverage of the Twitter files, they even targeted people, or actually also the Facebook files, uh, they also targeted people who shared memes that made fun of the coronavirus vaccines. So it's not just speech, it goes through memes, they get offended by memes. I can only imagine how an FBI agent who joined the agency to fight against terrorists and drug dealers, they're forced to go after somebody to share posted a meme on social media. It's not about your average FBI agent who certainly did not join the Bureau to be knocking on the doors of American citizens and asking them about what they posted on Facebook. It's yeah. it's the leadership and it's the political leadership more than anything. You could post something online about the Constitution and somebody out there on the left is going to call you an extremist for for but, talking up right, the Constitution. Right. Guys, and, uh, and, yeah, I'm sorry, Andrew. You end? got You got 10 seconds, Matt. I got to shut this down. Oh, I was going to say, you know, the, the law is not going to be applied evenly. I mean, if you say, if you want to advocate genocide against white, straight white men, the government's not going to go after you. But if you say, if you, ma if you make the wrong pronoun, then they're going to target you, of course. <laughs> okay. Well, so, so it's all in the quest of progressives to ensure no one harbors ill will. People, we are not prepared for war anymore. Thanks, panel. The economy is flourishing. Everybody has a great job and no one is suffering at the gas pump with food prices or when attempting to live the American dream. We are all so damn happy. Well, that message was brought to you by the Biden administration and we all know it's a bunch of baloney. In reality, what Joe Biden says is pretty much the exact opposite and his poll numbers show it. Here today to explain the absolute truth is Liberty Nation's economic guru, Andrew Moran. Unravel that spin, sir. Well, I would say that Bidenomics is about true and not an old brother. But I think the best place to start with is, is some of the recent economic indicators. So on the inflation front, you had back-to-back -back hotter than expected headline inflation readings in the consumer price index, the producer price index, and the Fed's favorite personal consumption expenditure PC price index. And then you have super core inflation, which, of course, if you watch Swampanomics TV, you'll get that reference. Uh, this is a key Fed gouge that assesses services excluding housing and energy. It's been head in the wrong direction on a three three month annualized basis it's up 6.9 percent and the labor fronts if you also read if you read uh, the pages of libernation.com you'll see that the headline numbers are dazzling but underneath the hood presents a completely different picture part-time jobs have soared full-time jobs have plummeted uh government and government related jobs have are, have been the top job creator in this economy record number of people are working two or more jobs everything else gas prices are rising again Interest payments are higher than the Department of Defense's budget. Sorry, Dave. Uh, credit card debt is all time high. <laughs> Delinquency rates are growing. This is not an exactly a strong economy, but the headline figures would suggest it. And I joke that, you know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the Census Bureau, they have no clue what they're doing. And they're just fiddling around with the Microsoft Expel spreadsheet formulas. Mr. Klar, you know, it, it was a, a, another show that we talked about um, how beef prices were going to continue to skyrocket. Will there be a plateau? I mean, how do people feed the family? You want to make a meatloaf and you can't afford to pound a hamburger. Well, I don't know because there are many market factors that can come to play. And But I can tell you a little bit about what's going on in the beef market. I do want to add to Mr. Moran's, Moran's uh, insightful no, Northern what did it say? You just called me a moron. Oh, my God. did just I call him a moron. <laughs> I, I, I stand corrected. It was um, a Freudian slip, so I'll blame go Freud. With, go, go with the verbal. Of course, accent. I meant nothing. I was just using the British pronunciation of your name. Um, <laughs> let's not forget commercial real estate. That's trembling and quaking because of during COVID, the vacancy rates are very high. Uh, you know, people are buying stuff online, so retail spa spaces are suffering. New York and other cities are taxing. Uh, the so-called wealthy and those increased taxes are passed on through triple net leases to the tenants. And then we have the whole, uh, you know, movement of people to working remotely. So office workers, the space isn't needed. And I'm not sure what that will do to the broader mortgage industry. 
in anticipation of this meeting, since I wrote my article about why beef prices will remain high, because we have a very low inventory of cows, the lowest since 1961, we have more people here. We are importing more beef, and I understand there's a new change in regulation. So at least when you buy beef that says it's from the USA, it's supposed to be. Um, but I think all of these things are also related to underlying inflationary factors like fuel prices and fertilizer prices and equipment prices are not coming down. These are long term inflationary pressures. Uh, the price of beef nationally has actually come down a bit since I wrote my piece. Uh, there could be that there's profit taking going on from people looking to sell animals. Here in Vermont, we've had a real shortage of feed. So I see some people are selling, they're literally running out of feed. But right now in Vermont, so I looked at the macro, the national price, the micro, I went on Craigslist, which is an indicator for me as a farmer. And I've never seen, it is a little early in the season. But there's almost no livestock available. I saw this morning yearling cows and heifers for 275 a pound live weight, which is an extraordinary, that's going to make people rush to get into the beef market, which will then pull more beef out for breeding from the processing facility. So there's potentially a vicious cycle here, which is not a market bubble. It's actually an inflationary pressure that will be sustained and not pop because as about, lamb and other prices go up, more people are going to be able to move towards beef. If I may say that everything that John has uh, just told us, I've been completely vindicated because if you go on the pages of LibertyNation.com all the way to late 2022, I wrote that beef prices would skyrocket based on uh, all the various factors. So everyone, please clap for me, please, because John just are you are you correct. still hey. sticking from John Pilar's accidental? Good for you. Good for you. He wants problem. to prove he's, he's a Moran and not a Moran. <laughs> Moran. And I do apologize, Andrew. Of course, oh, you're that's brilliant. just the King's English right there. You're you're uh, brilliant. You know, okay, great. You know we know the economy is in the toilet, and we, most people will. Um, you know, they may like Biden, but they also watch him. He's the oldest geezer on the planet and he's, you know, stumbling around. And as Andrew has reiterated, he can't speak very well. Careful with your hate speech. Just, blah, 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 blah. It might be hate speech. But, you know, Graham, where is Biden getting hit hardest in the polls? I thought it was immigration. Well, it's, uh, you know, you know, in terms of uh, what what policy areas are are causing him the most problems um yeah, it, it, obviously immigration has become a huge thing it's it's always the economy you know as our as our old uh, as our old pal james carville said many years ago it's the economy stupid and it always it, it, it always is the economy of course it's always you know kitchen what they call you know kitchen table politics but now of course the immigration uh situation has gotten so far out of hand that, that that's become a, a quite a dominant subject. I was actually looking at the polls in terms of uh, where Biden is strongest or weakest in terms of the the support he's getting from, you know, various demographics of voters. And um, it's interesting to see that a lot of Democrats are now worried that they're losing the support of young voters they're losing this using the support of of black and uh, Latino voters as well. And it's kind of interesting. Some of the polls are reflecting quite a worrying trend. Um, but of course, as we all know, you, you can't always read too much into the polls. You can't mm -hmm. take them as a as an absolute indicator of how this next election is going to turn out. But a lot of a lot of demographics that that are usually the strongholds, the foundations of democratic support during an election are, if not disappearing, certainly being eroded. And it's not necessarily that people are flocking to uh, to Donald Trump's banner um, because so many people have, you know, been brainwashed for so many years now that, you know, orange man bad. So... So it's it's not even so much that people are flocking to Trump; it's that people are flocking away from Biden. Um, and interesting polls. Uh, one one recent survey actually showed that uh, among the under thirty five uh, voting bloc, so so people eighteen to thirty four years old, almost sixty percent of them uh, answered a survey in which they said. Um, I'm not really even sure that I'm going to bother voting in the next election. 
Um, and that's a pretty, that's kind of a generally a bad sign, but it's definitely a very bad sign for uh, the incumbent because uh, he needs those voters. If they, if they desert him in, in large enough numbers, he's really got a problem. Right. They, uh, and I, I, I like to pivot to this angle too, because um, economy seems to, you know, well, let's face it, it drives everything that we do, but has Joe Biden's economy threatened our military strength or has, has it uh, has it actually increased our military strength? Well, as you point out, Daniel, any pe- pressure on the economy is going to impact the Defense Department's ability to buy stuff, you know, by the capability to protect the nation. It just is going to happen. And uh, the Biden administration, particularly with their assault on fossil fuels, I think is driving up the cost of uh, how the uh, how the military goes to war and uh it impacts the funds available to spend for uh, the important national security elements the pentagon competes for scarce resources that's always something people need to to remember and uh you know when the cost of goods and services rise across the economy as they have with the uh, biden administration there's always less purchasing power uh for defense And it's kind of an old saw, but uh, when one area of the U.S. economy catches a cold, the Defense Department pulls out a handkerchief. (laughs) An old saw. Well, don't worry, Dave, because uh, because all all of all of our brave men and women in uniform will be using the correct pronouns. So we're we're okay. We're all good. Yes, I. I, I saw recently in one of the you know uh, one of the military rags out there. I mean they 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 introduce a person, and then in the very next phrase or talk about they, what what is that? That's oh. undermining morale, and I wonder if that's part of what they're doing with the FBI agents badgering Americans when they're going to sort out who's willing to do whatever they're told. It seems to be a conditioning of the. The Ew. FBI agents in the military, as well as us. Well, that's interesting. That is. Yeah, thought, that, that is. I, interesting. I found it interesting of what Dave mentioned because I I, I share with him the story uh, happened a few years ago when uh, Biden launched a strike against the Houthis. He did it just after four o'clock on a Friday, and that's when the markets close and the oil prices cannot react. So I find that right. how a lot of decisions are being made based on market fundamentals as opposed to doing what's right. I think too there's there's something that uh, that that goes on with particularly uh, with defense and and inflation, and that is the lag time between the time a budget is developed and a, and the time that it's sent over to uh, to Congress for uh, for passing, and the deflator or the inflation index that's used across all the contracts is developed. 18 months prior to that budget going across. So it is a very much uh, a, a problem, particularly for uh, de- uh, defense contractors who price out their uh, wares based on what they think the uh, inflation index is going to be only to find out 18 months later that it's not that. Well, mm. you know, today the the ruling class in the swamp from the politicians to the bureaucrats, they rarely venture far from the corridors of power. They have no clue what is happening in low-income areas. They have no clue what's happening in the rural areas. They don't have a clue. But someone once said, hungry people do not go quietly. Guess we'll see. The amber waves of grain have become a political pawn on the global stage. Russia has taken over production and China is canceling long-standing orders with the US. Joe Biden has effectively curbed the American farmer through his green policies. I hate to throw this out there, but are we staring down the barrel of a food OPEC? John Clark, you penned a great article on this very subject for Liberty Nation. It's complicated, I know, but can you maybe fill us in and Something even I can understand, please. It, it is complicated, but people should, and more and more are, looking at where their food comes from. 
control the food, control the people has been as, uh, as, as old an adage as one group of people have ever been at war with another. What should be disturbing people is that U.S. wheat production has gone down. And indeed, many Biden administration policies do not care about whether farms are profitable, much like um, car manufacturers. Environmental regulations that are hazy, if not capricious and arbitrary, are hurting farms in their uh, purchasing and other uh, planning for the future. New SEC rules, which I have an article coming out about, uh, proposed originally and may yet require publicly traded companies to provide information about all of their downstream sourcing of products, including all of the farming in input costs. Many farmers are saying this would put them out of business. It would absorb their margins. In the case of Russia and China and this massive cancellation by China, of the largest uh, wheat shipment in history, it could be attributable simply to market factors, a bumper crop in, I think, South America. Um, Russia has amped up its production. Uh, Russia and China know about famine uh, from, from not having enough food, whether deliberately or not. And since the Crimean spring, actually, before our Ukraine war, Russia started severing its dependence on many European countries and started sourcing its own products, a massive sort of nationalism. And Putin and that country have been for years now funding farming, uh, supporting farmers, helping finance purchases of equipment, ac accessing markets and distribution. And now suddenly, as I quote in the article about the Chinese wheat uh, cancellation, it could be market factors, but it looks more and more like China and Russia are aligning on sharing commodities and and uh, sourcing them. Of course, China has been sourcing everything from rare earth uh, materials to uh, precious metals and, and everything in between around the world. Um, and Russia and China are getting, they're really out positioning America when it comes to uh, food exports and food even for their domestic production while we become more and more dependent on foreign sources for our food. It's not a good national security strategy. Andrew? How much money is the American farmer losing under these punitive policies of our well, radical left goofballs in the White House? I'd love to dive deeper into what John was talking about, but just to just answer your question, I would say that farmers, they're posting impressive income levels. The problem is that their input costs, and maybe John can attest to this, are absolutely through the roof. Cumulatively, things like natural, uh, excuse me, nitrogen and phosphorus, they've rocketed about 140% since January 2021. Diesel has spiked more than 100% in that time frame. The only uh, relief I can see on the way is that natural gas prices have absolutely tanked. In West Texas, they've turned negative because they're producing so much of it that producers mm. are paying the pipeline operators just to take it away from them. So I think that uh, that is a positive thing. However, uh, I would like to point out what John was talking about. I think this whole food OPEC uh, emanates from a couple of things. One is that uh, China and Russia, they've engaged in a de-dollarization campaign and the, they've accelerated since the Ukraine war and they want to settle more trade in non-dollar. So local currencies like the Chinese yuan and the Russian ruble. And then you know they, they, they want to have trade deals with uh, Brazil and use the Brazilian real. So I think that's part of it. And also the trade war that Trump started probably uh, emphasized the need to diverse away from the United States because that trade war was a disaster for both sides. I know it's quite popular to say, but you know, from an economic standpoint, that's 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 accurate. Uh, China, uh, and I think it was like 2017, 2018, they established a five or 10 year uh, soybean plan and China is the world's biggest soybean consumer and they want to farm more soybean uh, in their country as opposed to relying primarily on the, on the United States, which was their biggest market for uh, soybean. So I think this has been a long term trend to diverse away from the United States and focus more on regional trade when it comes to commodities. Well, how how will all this, you know, trickle down or waterfall down to the U.S. consumer, Graham? The easy answer to that question is uh, this is not going to turn out well for us. Um, but, uh, you know, when you uh, from one point of view, does America really need to dominate the market in all of these things? I mean, is is there is there a need for us to do that? Um, and and one could argue, no. If these other countries want to get together in their own little trading blocks and do their own thing and diversify away from the United States, well, you know, that's their right to do so. Um, but the problem is, I, I see a. And, and maybe I'm being a bit of a conspiracy theorist, although I suspect I'm not. The real problem about all of this is that there seems to be a 
uh, a, if you like, a politically motivated agenda beneath all of this, which is to strip away from the American people their ability to uh, produce anything at all. Uh, and and their and their ability to maintain any kind of level of independence, either a, on an individual level or or as a nation, um, that we uh, the, the the trend everything is moving towards, and it seems to be aided and abetted enthusiastically by the Biden, Biden administration. Everything is moving towards a situation where the uh, the American people are uh, have no ability to be self-reliant whatsoever and that we are all completely beholden to foreign countries in some cases our adversaries uh for even the most basic necessities of life and uh so you know i i, I don't see the you know I, I i i'm not sure about the need this this kind of need for america to be the the uh you know the the global source for all of these things for wheat or for anything else but the problem is it's literally decimating the ability of americans to have any kind of independence and and we're all going to end up being reliant for everything upon the government and upon unfortunately worse still foreign governments well i mean we've seen this happen before time and time again in in communist nations and honestly, I do think we need to have a global hold over these things. It keeps people from attacking us because they need us. Um, I, you know, back in, when Stalin That's and Mao a valid point of view. were wreaking havoc, they forgot, you know, the food supply problem. And then they had famine and then they had all sorts of issues. And uh, Dave, you can attest to, not that you were there, but... <laughs> I think you're right. There are very few things on the uh, geopolitical or geoeconomic landscape that, you know, really stirs up public outrage and, and assaults on existing governments, you know, more than hunger among its citizens or others. And and, and there's no actually no more effective tool we're finding than uh, in the communist socialist rhetorical toolkit than the portraying of some opposing political point of view as contributing to widespread hunger. A good example, 2010, when you had the uh, Arab Spring, uh, despite the fact that uh, the uh, Obama administration led by uh, Madam Hillary uh, wanted to portray this as a pro-democracy uprising in Egypt, the <laughs> The rioting took place because the government raised the price of bread 200 plus percent. And that's why they were in the streets. And another example, you know, uh, portraying poverty is no longer hunger or starvation in America. But it, we've now call, we now call it food insecurity. The <laughs> definition, incidentally, of food insecurity is the limited or unknown availability of nutritional and safe foods for everyone in a household to meet their basic needs. You know, that's a pretty broad definition, and uh, that could mean anything mm -hmm. from going without meals to being undecided between Pizza Hut or Burger King. However, this narrative is proving very, very effective. Well, because they weaponize the poverty. And in keeping with Graham's point, do we notice that while they're attacking cows as a threat to the planet and trying to foist upon us synthetic alternatives made from uh, soybeans or other plants that are uh, GMO <laughs> harvested, what about the dependency on the, the grid, not just to charge your EV car when you used to be able to keep a gallon of gas in the garage? What about for heat pumps here in Vermont? Uh, what happens when the power goes out? You mean now we freeze to death? We're dependent on you for everything. They've identified in this country farmers as a, a danger for 100 years to the mm -hmm. government, a danger in their view, because of farmers' independence. And they don't want that self-reliance because then you are, you're you going to give up, by the way, your Second Amendment for a hamburger. This pe The people of this country largely do not know what hunger is. And I, I fear that they're about to find out. And high enough prices could do it even without scarcity. And there's also a distribution system. A lot of this food is coming magically through um, you know, a supply system that itself is very 
fragile. Our trucking system, our container ships. Mm -hmm. Imagine if, you know, a port or a bridge went out in the wrong place. All of a sudden, you don't get your food anymore. A lot of our food's coming from California here on the East Coast, and people are oblivious to their vulnerability, even as they denigrate rural people and the rural farmers upon whom they depend for their food and their clean water. When did we stop being the breadbasket to the world? Our capability to generate food outstrips any other 10 countries put together. That may be an exaggeration, but it's close. And yet we're in this position, not because we can't, but because government in various forms has chosen to put us in this position. Is, am I close? Mm -hmm. Well, and look at That's, Holland. I think you are. I think you're on country. target. Yeah. Look at Europe and the war on the farmers there and why they're in the streets. And is that likely to happen in America? Probably not, because most of our food is produced by very, very large farms. And if they rally together with their tractors, I mean, they could, you know, maybe fill up the streets of, of Wichita, uh, but they're not going to shut down New York City. We just we, we, we have actually consolidated our farms here for a long time. So there are many layers of vulnerability of which you're right, Sarah, and all of you. People are, are not aware. Well, I can tell you they're becoming aware. People are waking up and they're anxious about their food and where it comes from. Look at Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka had the uh, Rajapaksa. He imposed all these green policies on the Sri Lankan farmers. And what happened? They're starving now. There's riots in the streets, overthrow government. You know, in the United States, though, I think last time I saw there about 10,000 farms that had to shut down because of, of the inflationary pressures and all these new regulations. I mean, look at this new regulation from the Biden administration, the uh, what's it called? The uh, polyfluorical uh, in, in the water. And that's going to add about what as much as $10,000 to household uh, budget because of this new regulation that's going to add to farmers' budgets and add to companies' budget, utilities, all, all these. And I think the main thing for farmers today are the amount of regulations that's being that that's being weighed on them by the current uh, environmental zealots in the White House. Um, I, many Americans are battling the new jungle of totalitarian monsters, including the World Economic Forum and the World Health Organization. And you know what? Maybe it's just time to worry about America. We'll let you make that call. Thanks, panel. Back by popular demand, it's just for fun. This week, we're highlighting the trivial stylings of Liberty Nation's own Kirsten Brooker. And you will all have multiple choice answers from which to choose because you really don't hold information well, as we've all seen before. Look alive, panel. We're going to go in a minute. The audience, though, no, nobody demanded my uh, to return as a no. host. Why? No. Why? What? I'm offended. No, if they did, it didn't get to me. So you will be back to host probably next time. <laughs> You're such a baby. Anyway. OK, here we go. And I can't pronounce this guy's name, so help me out. Poland President Andrzej Duda. That's it. Prime Minister Donald Tusk recently visited the White House to ask for <laughs> troops to help Kiev, money for Ukraine, or Beep. weapons and ammunition. You are correct. Dave Patterson. Please help me. Please help me with that name. And when I first read that Duda. question, I'm like, this has got to be a joke. Duda and Tusk. Duda and Tusk. It, yeah. They were on the vaudeville circuit from about 1919 to 1923. <laughs> That's what I was wondering. What is what is his first name? How do I pronounce that? Andrej? Yeah. Okay. Or Mr. 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 Duda. Duda, Duda Day. Those are easy Polish names. Duda, Duda. All right. Here we go. Question number two. White House lawyer blank wrote to Congress in a desperate attempt to end the impeachment process against President Biden. Would that be A, Edward Siskel, B, Jake Phillips, or C, Richard Sauber? A. Yeah, it is. I saw that guy on television almost nonstop. Which guy? 
Siskel. Oh. Well, I don't watch television. And Ebert. He was with Ebert. I was talking about Ebert. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No wonder. <laughs> Maybe I was We're all over this Siskel. stuff. <laughs> all right. Question number four. No, number three. I'm sorry. Three. What? While referring to the U.S. auto industry and the issues it has faced with Joe Biden and his policies. Bloodbath. Um, bloodbath it is. If I need any clarification on that. <laughs> that should have, been, should have been a good one. Second. Next question. New voter laws in Arizona allow non-citizens to vote only for the U.S. House, the U.S. Senate, and... Presidential election. C is right. Presidential elections. This is wrong. Isn't that wrong? uh, Well, during World War II, you know, Roosevelt came up with a thing. I'm sorry. And that was totally different. I missed that. What? Uh, that, 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 that's, that, what that's in for a, there's going to be a massive legal battle over that, I'm quite certain. Good. God, I'm glad I don't live there anymore. Okay. Bernie Sanders announced on March... Thir- on March... Oh, dear. <laughs> on March 13th that he would be introducing legislation that would establish... 32 hour work week. Yes. Okay, I'm not even going to read the options. I'm just going to let you go. Okay. Psychology Today, which we should all be reading anyway, (laughs) cited agitation, irritability, combativeness, and inappropriate behavior as common symptoms in the aggressive stages of... Alzheimer's disease. Being Andrew Moran. No. (laughs) Trump derangement syndrome. Yeah, dementia. Dementia. Oh, dementia, dementia. It was dementia, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's all leading up to Joe Biden. <laughs> Alzheimer's is not dementia. No, dementia no, is a yes, it's, uh, d- different symptom. things. Yeah, yeah, different things. Yeah. In January of this year, voters in this state received robocalls that mimic Joe Biden and gave voters false information regarding the election. New Hampshire. Yes. Somebody has been paying attention, and it's not John Clark. <laughs> I don't have time to watch TV. I'm a farmer. Dave must sit in front of that box all day. Yeah, horses and dogs and... Ugh. Okay. I was out shearing my sheep the other day and somebody mentioned to me <laughs> that uh, it was New Hampshire. <laughs> oh, good gosh. Okay, according to fiscal and economic research director Bryce Hill, the primary reason that thousands of citizens are fleeing Chicago... And Illinois as a whole is because immigration. Is because of good grief. No wonder I have to give Andrew back this job. <laughs> it's because of what? Immigration. Illegal immigration. No. Gun, gun violence. No. no. <laughs> Taxes. Yes. Hey, <laughs> that was a good guess. <laughs> good My brother lives there and he just absolutely loves being ruled yeah, by. He's, he's... The left. Do you pronounce his last name Moran or Moran? Oh, I do. I knew it. I do it. I do it. Okay. After rushing legislation to pass the latest spending bill, House Speaker Mike Johnson is now on the chopping block, following a motion to vacate, proposed by Marjorie Taylor Green. Marjorie Taylor Green. Oh, uh, Graham got that one. That's the right to vote. Oh no 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 no! I was that was, I got that. I got that. I was uh, I'd already no. finished saying her name Graham before you started saying her name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A recent study shows this method of weight loss is connected to a 91% higher risk of periodic fasting. Oh fasting, yeah, fasting, sorry. Fasting. fasting. Yeah, yeah, fasting. Yep. No, it's 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 periodic fasting. Intermittent. Yeah. Intermittent yeah. fast. Intermittent. I, I do that. I do that. I, I do about 18 hours and uh, it feels good. Me too. I, 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 I do I, I've always practiced intermittent fasting. I mean, I fast between meals. I have done my whole life. Me too. Mm-hmm. I had breakfast. I, mean, I haven't eaten since. When I'm, when I'm not right. eating a meal, I'm, I'm not eating, so I'm fasting. Do coffee or alcohol count? <laughs> <laughs> Just ask. No. 
Ask him control. for a friend. Yeah. Okay, a trio of Maryland, Maryland. This job is going back to Andrew, man. My eyes are killing me already. A trio of Maryland gun cases held last week were heard on bonk, meaning the, the entire full, court. The full court. The, the whole circuit. The full court press. No, the full, John the full Clark court. gets a point. He's on the board. <laughs> My great aspiration in life to make the board. Oh, well, there you are. You're finally there. Okay. After proposing in 2021 to buy TMTG, Trump Media and Technology Group, blank, finally voted to merge with the former president's company. The Digital World Acquisition Corporation or Truth Social, uh, yeah, one of those. You got it, Andrew. That's stock. I mean, I don't know why people are so surprised that it was losing money and then it tanked. You know, that stock hit, what, $75? And now last time I checked, it was around 50 bucks. That company's been bleeding so much money, but the, but, but the investors act like they were surprised by it with that sell-off. Regarding <laughs> abortion, Donald Trump has suggested that he would support- 15 weeks. Yes. Dave. Okay. Major League Baseball superstar. Joey Otani. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the rest of the question is, stands accused of, yet ad adamantly <laughs> denies sports gambling. I can't read. I can't. I've used all my words today. I got to stop. I just, it doesn't make, that story doesn't make sense to me at all because he, with his translator, he was with him day in and day out for years and years. How the heck would he not know this at all? You know, it's just, I mean, maybe I'm being serious there. I mean, I like Shoei Otani. He, he was like, he's the greatest player on the planet for being a two-way player, but it just, it, it reeks of, of cover-up by uh, uh, MLB leadership. Who watches baseball? I want to watch this baseball. Baseball is the greatest sport ever lived. It's the greatest of all time. You know? Yeah, but it's America's sport, Andrew, not Canada's. <laughs> it's not part of the Frisbee golf is better. Okay, what newly created DOJ office will focus on prohibiting those considered a danger to themselves or others from purchasing or owning a firearm? Oh, this is the, uh, it's, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the it's, it's name. It's called the it's, Risk Mitigation something. Yeah, uh, the Extreme uh, extreme Risk Order Resource Center or something within the Justice Department. Does anybody want to add a couple more? Uh, yeah, it's got a big, long name. Yes, I, I, and I, yeah, I'm ashamed to say that I can't name the, the, the uh, resource center exactly because I, I wrote about it, but it's, okay. but, it's, but, it's but it's something like the, the National Extreme Risk Protection Order. Resource. Oh, 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 you got it. You got it. Oh, there we go. it. Very good. Yeah. It's the thing. You know, it's the thing. <laughs> it's the thing. <laughs> Orwell had another name for it. I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was... All right. This is our final question. Look alive, everybody. Jump in. On March 25th, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a new law that would prohibit children under the age of 14. Social media. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Yeah, children under the age of 14, yeah, can't use social media. Yeah. That's All right, weird. Dave and I are tied, 5-5. Five, five. Look at that. <laughs> I'll split it with you. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, that's all she wrote, folks. If you want to play more trivia, news of the week, visit www.LibertyNation.com. Test your knowledge. Thanks, panel. Thanks, guys. See you next time. That's it for our Conservative 5 panel today. Check out our other C5 shows and segments on your favorite video platform. YouTube, Vimeo, Rumble, we're on them all. As well, Liberty Nation has its own Roku channel where you can see all of our TV productions. I'm your host, Sarah Cowgill. Thanks for joining us today for free thinking, free speech, libertynation.com.